Hi everyone, welcome to the house. I'm here to let you know about a couple things coming up and four ways for you to be part of our church community. The first way to be part of our church community is through Next Steps. If you're new or newer here, Next Steps is our process to help you become part of our church community. We offer three steps through our Next Steps process. Step one, open house lunch. Step two, mission and values. And step three, the house is my home where you can officially make the house your home church. Next Sunday, we're going to be hosting step two, mission and values. We would love for you to be a part. If you've already gone through step one, then this is for you. You can go ahead and sign up online under our coming soon page. We look forward to seeing you there. The second way to be a part of our church community is through groups. Groups exist to help you grow and develop deeper communities, specifically here at the house. We are just finishing season one of Connect Groups, which we will pick back up starting in May for season two. But in the meantime, for all of you who maybe want to continue on in your connection with other people and growing in that deeper community, we want to encourage you to join uh, one of our ongoing connect groups that happens immediately after service in the fireside room. So until May, you are welcome to join that connect group. The third way to be a part of our church community is through events. Events are one-time experiences to help inspire and encourage our church community. We would love to invite you to celebrate Easter with us here at the house. We're going to start on March 24th celebrating Palm Sunday with a lovely Sunday service. We'll head straight into Good Friday that following Friday on March 29th with a 6.30 p.m. service. We would love to go ahead and invite your friends and family as we culminate for Easter Sunday, the last Sunday of this month on March 31st at 10 a.m. And to make it fun for the kids in our church community, we're going to be hosting an Easter egg hunt immediately after service for friends and family to also come be a part and watch all the kids go ahead and gather their Easter eggs. The fourth way for you to be a part of our church community is through classes. Classes exist to help you learn biblical principles to grow your faith. We have just begun the Book of Acts with Pastor Dana on Wednesday nights via Zoom. For anybody who maybe missed the first one, I want to encourage you, you can still be a part of this Bible study. The way to do so is just go online under our Coming Soon page and you can sign up there. That's all for now. We'll see you next Sunday. Hey everyone, my name is Wes. I'm the pastor here at the house and wherever you're watching, we just want to say thanks for joining us. Today, we are on part two of this series about how to prepare my soul for Easter. Now, Easter is just a couple of weeks away, so how do I prepare for that? How do I prepare for, you know, not just getting my new Easter hat or dress or suit or getting my shoes shined or whatever, not just preparing that way, but how do I prepare me? for Easter and for what God's going to do. And today, we're going to continue on that series as we've been talking about how do, I, how do I prepare my soul for Easter, the body and the blood. We've been talking about receiving communion together. And if you didn't watch last week, you can check that out. Today, we're jumping into part two. Gospel Mark, chapter number 14 says this. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread. He blessed it and he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples saying, take it. For this is my body. Took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. That agreement, that's what that word covenant means. It's a, it's a holy agreement. And he says, it is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn. And they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, a little bit of background on this text. Last week, we read uh, Matthew's gospel account. Today, we're talking about Mark's gospel account. And those two are extremely similar. Whereas uh, Luke's account that we're going to talk about next week, Luke's account is a little bit more uh, fuller. Uh, he includes some other parts of the story. And then also Paul, uh, when he's talking to the Corinthians, he includes, it's a, it's a little bit larger as well. But this text tells us the story of Jesus sharing what is known as the Passover meal 
with his disciples. Now, these are all uh, Jewish people who are following Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one that Jews had been looking for. And they celebrated this meal called Passover. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feast over a couple of days where they remember where God rescued them from Egypt and brought them out into their promised land. The Jews had been enslaved for over 400 years in Egypt under a wicked ruler after a wicked ruler. And they enslaved them. And they, were, they were incredibly harsh towards them. And God said, I've heard your prayers and I'm going to rescue you and I'm going to bring you out. And in one night, in an act of judgment, God says, hey, Pharaoh, you and all my people, he tells them through Moses, let my people go. And they don't listen. And so God's angel strikes Egypt, not God's people, but strikes Egypt. But the angel passed over all of God's people. That's why this feast is called Passover. Because they remember when the angel passed over them, judged Egypt, and passed over them. And then God used that to rescue and to bring them out. Jesus took bread, and at our service, when we remember these moments, we, we use this little wafer like this, but he took uh, what is most likely an unleavened bread, maybe a, a big piece of matzah or a cracker of some sort. He takes his unleavened bread, and most likely he prayed this prayer that would be a very traditional prayer in the Passover meal, something like this. Blessed are you, or blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. But then Jesus introduces a new element to the story by saying, by the way, guys, this is my body. And he gives it to his disciples and he commands them. He goes, eat this, all of you. Then after the meal, he takes a cup. And at our services, we use these little uh, individual cups. Most likely at that meal, they had one cup that they would uh, all celebrate together. And this is most likely at the third time that this happens. And so they would actually water down the wine so that people didn't get drunk by the end of the meal. But by the time the third cup comes, most likely he says this prayer, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Very similar language to when Jesus says in the gospel of John, he says, I am the bread of life and I am the true vine. And he gave thanks for it. And that word thanks is where we get uh, the word Eucharist, which means like to give thanks. So if you've ever heard someone describe uh, communion or the table as Eucharist, this is where they receive that from. And he, and he takes that cup and he shows it to his disciples and he says, this is my blood. This is my body. This is my blood. You know, throughout history, the world has kind of gone between these extremes of reason and romance. You can see this as you study history. There's these ages of reason where everything comes down to deduction. And then the pendulum kind of swings. And you can see this throughout history and in the arts where everything then swings over to romanticism and they, because they realize everything can't be reasoned. And then they swing the pendulum way over here to just everything is romance and feelings and thoughts and emotions. And then, then it swings back over. Now, this story here where Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, this is going to be very problematic if you are the type of person who needs to understand everything. If everything for you must come down to deductive reasoning, I, may have, I must be able to prove this. It must be able to be seen scientifically factual and you want to eliminate faith. This story is going to be extremely problematic because deduction in wisdom and reason, they definitely have a place. I want to be very clear on that. Deduction, wisdom, and reason, they definitely have a place and they're not at odds with God. But deduction, wisdom, and reason also at some point have an end when Jesus holds up bread and he says, this is my body. And he holds up a cup and he says, this is my blood. And if you're just trying to deduce and reduce everything down to a factual instance, that's going to be very problematic. The meal itself, the, the bread and the cup is mystical. There's a certain element of mysticism following Jesus. Because Jesus is one, he's full of grace and truth, and he's a teacher. But there's also a certain element of mysticism around Jesus. 
not just practical. Jesus didn't just talk about budgets and timesheets and schedules and reason and wisdom and this you know was everything wasn't just black and white but jesus also spoke in types and shadows and in colors communion reminds you and i when we receive communion together it should remind you that there is a part of this life that is mystical that cannot be reduced to just facts there's a part of receiving communion that reminds us that there's something beyond the world that we see. There's something about communion that reminds us that we are not just a body, but we are a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body, that there's a a spiritual world out here that you and I cannot see with our physical eyes. You see this throughout the Bible where the, the, the physical world looks like one thing, but in the spirit, there's something different happening. Elisha prays for a servant. He says, God, open up my servant's eyes that he could see what is actually happening here. And and, and the Lord opens up the servant's eyes and he sees that there are God's angels and armies of heaven surrounding them. And, And he goes, oh, there really are more with us than there are with them. There's something happening in the spirit that cannot be seen in the natural. When we receive communion together, it reminds us that this meal is mystical and that there is more going on in your life than what can be seen in the natural. Friedrich Schleimacher, an ancient theologian, says it like this when he's talking about religion and all this. He says, it's a sense and a taste for the infinite. This meal reminds us that there's something beyond the finite that we see. There's a spiritual world. The world is not just the world that you and I see. There's a spiritual world with spiritual realities. Second thing about this meal, that his presence is very real when we receive communion together. Now, there are certain extremes when it comes to communion. Uh, Some people believe that when they say, this is my body, in some faith worlds, they actually ring a bell and they believe that it literally turns into the physical, like DNA body of Christ. And this is my blood, this is the actual DNA evidence of Jesus' blood. And on the other extreme, some people just see it as, oh, it's just kind of like a signpost. It's like a directional arrow. It's not that important. And both of of those extremes are wrong. There's this thing somewhere in the middle where Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst. This is where forgiveness happens. This is where grace happens. And that Jesus is present in a very special way when we receive communion. May not necessarily become the actual body and blood, but it's so much more than just a signpost to point us to Jesus. So how can it be, you may be asking, hey Wes, how can it be that Jesus is with me when we receive this communion? How can this be? Because the Bible said that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So the gospel is God coming to us. Communion, as even Calvin, as he would say, is, Calvin would say it like this, that we go up and we elevate and we experience God. Not that he comes down to us, but that we are elevated. He says this, that we are lifted up to heaven with our eyes and minds to see Christ there in the glory of his kingdom. It's like echoing that language in Revelation says two different times, hey, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I was caught up. I was caught up. I was in that place where Christ dwells. Or as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, hey, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I just know this. I was praying and I was caught up. I was somewhere that I have never, ever been before. I was caught up into heaven. There is a faith element. As I just said a minute ago about that, there's there's this mystical part of communion, but there is a faith element to this. Faith is when I come to the table, when I come to the Eucharist, when I come to communion and I receive this, if I just approach this as a wafer and a cheap plastic cup, I will not receive any of the blessings of his very real presence. It would be like that there's a gift underneath a Christmas tree at your house. The gift is there whether you open it or not. 
So the question is not whether he is present or not. The question is whether these elements will have any power in your life. Do this the next time that you receive communion. Pause for a moment. I do this every time I receive communion. I pause for a moment because I don't want to just rush out. I don't want this just to be a wafer and this just to be a cheap plastic cup. I go, Jesus, you said that this was your body and this is your blood. And so I receive you in faith. There's a faith element. One person said it like this, like salvation, communion is a gift offered to everyone, but this doesn't become effective unless I receive it in trust. Or as Jesus said it in Matthew, Gospel of Matthew chapter number nine, as your faith, so be it unto you. So the next time that you come to receive from the table, you receive from the body, you receive from the blood, you take a look at that bread and you take a look at that cup, whether it's a big cup, whether it's a, a plastic cup, whatever it is, and you remind yourself, Jesus, thank you that your body is present in my life. You were broken so that I could be made whole and your blood was shed so that I could be with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. We love you. We would love to see you on a Sunday morning. Check out thehousela.org and we will save you a seat. We've got some great coffee, some great friends, and we'll see you soon here at the house. God bless.